Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am delighted to introduce you to Jim Yu. Jim uh, is a friend for a few decades, but more importantly for all of you, um, he is the founding CEO and now executive chair of Bright Edge, which is the number one enterprise uh, search engine optimization platform. And that's you know over 100 million in revenue. Uh, and is used by 57 of uh, Fortune 500, uh, Fortune 100 companies. So, Jim, welcome to the pod. Excited to dive in with you into all things uh, that it takes to build a leading marketing technology platform as a CEO and as a marketer. Great to be here, Alex. Uh, excited to uh, excited to chat. Well, I mean for. First, for our audience, you know, you're um, you, you can you, you impressed me with where we were doing one joint project while we were getting our MBA together, and you pretty much did the whole project for the both of us in a in a, in, a, in a moments of like of, of just just rapid execution. That's when I realized, oh, there's a accidentally I got into the same class with this really bright guy, Jim, and then I realized that you also uh, were um uh able to get into college really at a young age do you want to tell us a little bit of the backstory yeah. uh of just how smart you are because i think uh the world needs to <laughs> to understand that we're not just talking <laughs> to somebody who only works hard but has like a combination going on there well i i think uh i, I i'm happy to show the story i think uh also you know as as you mentioned uh you you and i went to business school together and and alex you you were always one of the the crazy smart uh guys in the class i was thinking about you as uh you know the, you were always kind of the guy thinking about strategy right like thinking about things from a very strategic angle and so that's one of the things i always remember and, and just an all-around uh nice nice guy um so uh, it's it's great to uh, catch up. Gosh, it's almost twenty years. Yeah. Uh, you know, twenty years since business school. But um, you know, so my story in terms of graduating young is uh, I fell in love with computers at a very young age, and so I started programming when I was seven years old. It was like on one of those seven really years old. Just repeating, <laughs> repeating. In case somebody didn't hear well, seven years old. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. It was like one of those. Uh, so I, I had you know one of those computers where it was the first generation Intel chips, right? The 8088. Uh, I'm dating myself a little bit here, but it was the 8088 processor. It was one of the early sort of uh, desktop computers, and I, I learned about sort of basic, right? GW Basic. It was like um, the, the the a very simple programming language, and started programming games. And as I got into it, I started to want to build more complex software. And so I started taking uh, a programming class uh, in, in, in C, right? Because the lower level language was C. And so that's when I took one of the first uh, college classes. I was nine years old. And I took a class, uh, a college class in, in programming in C. And, and then so from there, I also really enjoyed math. So I started taking calculus, I think it was 10 or 11. And then, and then just started full time when I was 12 and then graduated uh, when I was 16. Uh, 16. I, I, I so graduated kind of at 16. Time. Graduated at 16. Yeah. Um, uh, other characteristic that <clears throat> I think a lot of those that are more entrepreneurial folks would be. So um, when you were just starting out with Bright Edge, you know, I, I remember mm -hmm. having having a chat in the early days and and you were like the definition of scrappiness. Do you want to tell a story <laughs> yeah. of the of the Costco Costco runs and just all the sort of yeah, stuff yeah, that you yeah. were doing to make ends meet in the early well, days, just so people understand that it's not just about the brain power which you have, the work ethic, but also this this maybe immigrant scrappy mentality that that <laughs> helped yeah. helped you get there. So you're, 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 you 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 uh, you're definitely bringing me back and uh, uh, to to some you know. Uh, Fun, fun. I think nostalgia is an in interesting thing, right? <laughs> you know, I remember fondly those early stage days, right? And so I started Bright Edge. Uh, you know, I quit my job at Salesforce. Uh, my wife and I just had a baby. So it was like, you know, I, I always knew I wanted to start a company. I had this idea that, you know, everything was going to go 
not only sort of online, but people would have to be able to be easily discoverable online. And the big companies that optimize their digital presence for search. Um, and so that was the idea. And so the first thing we realized that, or I realized we needed to build was one of these, um, this index, right? This, 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 uh, this index of the web that would see kind of where do websites show up in search engines, right? So you could literally, we think of it as the data cube, this, this massive cube, millennial, my PTO and I kind of built the, the, the data cube. But the way we had to build the data cube, because we were bootstrapping in the first part of the company, was we needed a lot of machines and we needed a lot of bandwidth for our followers, right? Because you got to go index all the stuff. And to, you know, and because we hadn't raised money, what we needed to do is get a lot of machines. And to get machines, we were like, oh, how are we going to do this? We had $3,000 all in into the company, $3,000. And so we were like, we have to do this within this budget. And so figure out, we were kind of scratching our heads, super constrained. And then we figured out that Costco had, at that time, a super generous return policy. So you could buy the machine, use the machine, and then return the machine within like a six month period, right? And so, so what we did is like, okay, we'll buy these machines because the way you build an index is, you know, there's a lot of crawling and a lot of processing, but you can then afterwards compress it all down and then serve it out of a, 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 a single index. And so we bought all these machines, got to know a lot of folks at Costco really well, did a lot of the dollar ninety nine burgers and hot dogs at the lunch. Right, right. Entrepreneur friendly lunch, right? And uh, Lemuel was crashing my couch, so he moved up from SoCal. He was living with my wife and I and our baby in a in a thousand square foot apartment. So talk about scrappy. So the the, the apartment was stacked with these machines on, on the kitchen to the table, and then we were running these machines. 24 seven because you're building these indexes and you're just like running them, trying to saturate all the, 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 the key resources of the machine, right? So you're tuning it to maximize the processor, maximize the IO, right? So that it's indexing really quickly uh, and then ultimately compressing it down and then serving it off the index. And so, so yeah, it was, it was uh, so, so we basically got to know the folks at Costco well. We returned the machines. They're very friendly about it. Now they changed the return policy. Yeah, so I don't think we have anything to do with that. But, <laughs> but, but I don't think this you can do this so anymore. This is so awesome. I just want to like, I just want to give you a shout out because, and, and by the way, I just, I was very proud of myself because at some point, you know, I, we, my my co-founder was living with his go with his girlfriend in an apartment, and I moved in with them. <laughs> You know, when we, when we were doing our thing, and I thought, like, this is so cool. But we didn't have stacks of computers, and we didn't have a kid, oh. so <laughs> you know, in the same place. It's, uh, and, and the computers are really interesting because in the summer, it gets it gets really hot, right? And so we had like all these machines, and it was literally like it was literally generating all this heat. And the thing about the 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 the, the machines is you can't let them overheat, right? Because you're, you're otherwise they kind of you burn out the drive. And so then we got this, we got this portable air conditioner, right? But it was pointed at the machine area. Yeah, it just it doesn't uh, melt. <laughs> so, so then we're like sitting there coding, right? And, and you're, you're, you're having to, you're sweating, sweating, you're sweating. We're, we're yeah. like in sweat <laughs> while we're like keeping the machines cool, I like building this index. And that's how the data cube was built. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, as a founder, this is a big part of just, I feel like, that that sort of embracing the constraints right and like the creative problem solving and figuring out whatever i gotta do to go hit that outcome i'm gonna blow through those obstacles and constraints to make it happen so let me let me ask you on this it's a little controversial um and I, I, like mm -hmm. there is this notion of the immigrant founder right and you know i i have a feeling that yep. what what prepared me you know for whatever entrepreneurial or other things i'd be doing was the immigrant journey more than any kind of yeah. academic training like you know and knowing that hey you know if you if my parents you know at, at certain age got like moved with the kids and did their thing then you know what? I I can handle whatever is coming at me, right? And yep. I feel like the folks that you know, whether it's immigration or just living in a in a you know difficult environment, you know, uh, financially or otherwise, they just develop this 
extra bit of resilience um, mm-hmm. that then helps them um, go and you know do great things, right? Right now we're all joking about this, but yeah. you're like a hundred million plus in your recurring revenue business, right? Like so, this is we're yeah. past these days. But in those early days, do you feel like that particular um, part of the journey, you know, scrappy, like was that the defining part or core part of you know your success? Yeah. Like guide us a little bit on that. I think that's right. And I think it's actually now hindsight is very interesting, right? Because it's been 16 plus years since I started Bright Edge. And so looking backwards, you kind of see these interesting dots, right? Mm-hmm. That, 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 that are there. Is, is this I like, uh, big, is this like the Steve Jobs dots that was at our exactly. graduation? You, you, <laughs> in that, at our graduation, right? You remember that speech and that, that, that speech stuck with me a lot because Especially as you if you go back and think about things, you're like, ah, oh, this makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think for entrepreneurs, I think resiliency is super important, right? And and I think whether you're an immigrant, but I think of it almost like this chip on your shoulder. There's this, yeah. in, in a way, there's this chip, right? I grew up, my parents were immigrants. I grew up in a trailer park as the only Asian kid in 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 a trailer park in South Dakota. And so a big part of that is whatever you're facing, right, as an entrepreneur, you're always like, well, trailer park, I can like, always go back to the trailer easy, park. <laughs> easy. Like, I, I shouldn't have made it this far anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but in hindsight, it's also really interesting. And I, I didn't realize this until much later is that the, the why of why the, the why behind what you're doing in a long journey of building a company is very important, right? I think resiliency starts with that chip on your shoulder for a lot of us, right? For me, it was the guy who grew up in a trailer park. And, and, and a lot of this is like, that, that gives you this ability to plow through. But a lot of that sometimes is driven by fear of failure, mm. right? It's kind of like, I just can't fail. I will find a way and make it through, right? But eventually, there's a moment when it's like, well, it's not about that anymore, yeah. right? And, and then it's like, why do you get up in the morning and go just as hard? And, and so there's this bit that flips that I think has to happen where it becomes kind of, you, you're, you're not doing it out of fear or failure, but you're doing it out of love of mission, right? And there's this, yeah. there's this interesting thing, right? And the why starts to evolve in that journey um, and because it's not really for entrepreneurs, I think, ever just about the money. Money is just one of the things. Of course, it's important, but you're not starting a company to just to make money. There are many other ways where the you know, as we know, right, ex- business school expected value is higher. Like it, yeah, yeah, there's there's better easier ways to make a lot of money, right? Especially much easier if you ways to make money. Graduated you know, high school at 16 and, you know, college or whatever, whatever your like records are. Uh, so, um, so, but, but interesting, let's tap into that because there is a fear motivation, but maybe there's just this, I, I would call it like, it just something you said, you know, find a way or make a way mentality. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think yep. that's different than fear. I think it's just mm-hmm. maybe, just something in the DNA or kind of some sort of a habit that you can like, Hey, we can, we can make through this and fear could be a part of it, but it doesn't have to be. And then on top of it, there's also like, what's the, the, you know, you know, the shiny, shiny beacon on the hill to what's our mission. What's the kind of, what's the promised land that we're taking, um, you know, and moving towards, but there's something about like a lot of people talk about promised land and wax poetic about the future, mm-hmm. but just lack the stamina, you know, oh, yeah. or like the, <laughs> this, yeah. this crappiness. And I think like, it's somehow it almost feels you need, you need, you know, the both. two right together. Right. Like it does you not one the, or the you other. Need both. Yeah. 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 You need to, I mean, there's a, there's a element of grit and yeah. perseverance and creativity and problem solving and kind of that is a is, is part and parcel to the journey of building something it's yeah. hard by definition right you're creating something and it's it's 
you know, you're putting yourself out there every day and it's hard, yeah. right? And it's, uh, and, and so, yeah, there's, there's definitely an element of grit and perseverance. And, but I think there's always this dichotomy that's kind of interesting where you need both things, right? And, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, uh, it's, and at what it's, point it's, did uh, you realize mm -hmm. that you, that the grit and perseverance is no longer enough? So like, I'll just tell you, like, in my own head, like, again, coming from the sort of scrappy, refugee immigrant background i remember you know i was like really impressed the first time i stayed in a four-star hotel as a consultant oh, that yeah. was delivering like very limited amount of value in retrospect <laughs> but it was like definitely enjoying enjoying disproportionate like benefits of a, of a particular job and and like that was kind of fun the first time but then it kind of wasn't as enticing afterwards right then there was like, okay, we want to travel and see everything. So as unlike some harder working classmates, I did this backpacking around the world trip after after Stanford. And like towards the end of it, I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. This is like, I know for sure I don't want to retire at any point in time because I'll just kill myself. Because they're like, no matter what challenges you come up with yourself, at some point you get, you know, bored, right? Like, because it's not the sort of, so you fulfill the, the dream of some sort of uh, success, whatever be benchmark, mm -hmm. right? Some sort of, but it's not really meaningful. So when was that? That was yeah. my kind of discovery. When is that for you? And especially when you're building a company for 16 years, right? Like you've reached certain milestones when you're successful and you can, you can move on to do other things. When did you start feeling like, okay, I've done it. Was it like at Salesforce? Was it at Stanford? Was it, you know, midway through the company journey. Have you had that moment, <laughs> you know, yet? I have, not, I, have, I have not had that moment, right? I feel like there's this thing I was reading. I, I was like, it's it, it, this thing around like, you know, kind of, it, it's, you've never arrived, right? You're always becoming, like mm. it's, it's, it's always, you're always changing, right? You're always trying to figure out sort of what are you trying to become, right? And I think, um, I haven't found that yet. I mean, I, it's interesting. There are moments when I feel like, oh, we just did something really, really cool, right? I remember maybe there's there's these parts along the way when it's like you look back and you say, wow, we actually, you know, whether it's you signed your first customer or you raised your first round or, you know, yeah. you, 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 you got to a certain milestone. And those are fun. Like those, those are moments where I think it is actually as an entrepreneur, a lot of times it's easy to kind of not celebrate that as well um or kind of just move on to the next um which which I, I certainly i think i do a lot um but but it's always a, a bit of like what what are you what are you gonna what are you gonna become next right and, and i think that 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 i think it's a helpful way to keep learning right because i yeah. think especially in our business right just just what you and i do in, in tech gosh the change is insane the rate of change is insane right and 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 that's that's what makes it exciting but it also keeps you on your toes right like every part of these businesses and these ecosystems are going through disruption right and it's, it's pretty fascinating well let's let's dive into our business in particular and maybe our, the niche of, of people that we're serving which are kind of enterprise mm -hmm. marketers maybe in some cases mid-market marketers um as well mm -hmm. um so Everybody has heard of search and the importance of Google yeah. in our lives, right? Like the broader category yeah. for this is revenue or performance marketing kind of portion portion of that. You were um, obviously doing some of that for yourself, you know, in your pet projects. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when you look back now at the role of search in the last, you know, 15 years, and going forward, yep. like, w w do you feel like, it, like, it almost feel like at some point it was all important, you know, now it's, yep. it's shifting and was the noise around the eye, it's a little bit uh, more contested, right? And you're beginning to worry about what's the future going to be. So guide us a little bit on, on the broader space around search, search engine marketing. Yeah, I think you. search in general has been really important almost since the beginning of the internet, right? Because at, at the heart of it, right, the, the power of the internet is that it, it was 
inter it was kind of connecting all the different types of information right there was like was a nsf project that connected these universities and mm -hmm. departments of, of, of different divisions of the government and and so almost since the beginning of the, the, the web with this decentralized model you needed a way to organize all that information to make sense out of it right and so and 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 Google obviously came up with a model that was just better in, term, in terms of its algorithms and in terms of performance, relevance, and all these things that proved that it could be a very powerful, first, a very powerful end user tool, right, for getting access to information. But for the most part, it didn't fundamentally change for the last, you know, decade or so. I mean, there have been a lot of incremental kind of powerful innovation, but the, the model itself of put in a keyword, and you get 10 kind of uh, different sort of links of interesting information and with, you know, that, that you make sense out of yourself as a, as a end consumer, that model has been in place for almost since the beginning of the internet, um, since before Google. Now, when we started the company, what was interesting is those were the early days of search engine marketing. So most of the focus at that time was on, hey, pay per click, I bid on a keyword, and a little bit of ad space, you click on it, high conversion intent results in performance, results in revenue. And so we, we were really going after helping companies earn their audience and be able to be easily kind of discoverable online through search engine optimization with technology and then help them kind of drive business performance and, and, and revenue from that. Um, and for the most part, a lot of that has been a very interesting and very important category, right? It's something that almost every business, you know, whatever industry they're in, something between 30% to 60% of all of their online traffic comes from organic search. Um, and so that is, is why it went from something where when I was starting company, when I was starting Bright Edge, when we were kind of explaining what we do, people were like, what is that? Why would we do it? They just pay for the click. And now something that almost every, every, certainly every enterprise and most companies know about and do something about. Um, and so that's been kind of the evolution. Now, this moment right now is pretty interesting because of Gen AI, right? And AI has been around for a long time in search, right? In fact, one of the reasons that OpenAI, the, 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 the inventor of chat GPT, started was because of a debate between Elon Musk and the founders yeah. of Google, right? Where they're like, hey, you can't have one company that basically gets all the engineers that know AI in one place. And the original thesis was create an open source version of AI for the benefit of the planet, right? And so the kind of versus a closed system of AI that's only benefiting the largest search engine in the world. That was kind of the original sort of intention behind open AI. Um, and what that did though, is as they built that technology, they, they were really going after this mission of, of of, of, of artificial general intelligence, right? Of, of kind of trying to make the AI closer and closer to human capabilities, right? And they achieved something with the, trans, you know, sort of the transformer model, the GPT, something that's the, that, that actually starts to really become very interactive and start to unlock a lot of new capabilities. So this gen AI movement, right? And so that actually for search, I think means that it doesn't make search less important. The fundamental use case of search, of organizing information, making sense out of all the world's information, putting it at the fingertips of consumers, whether they are you know, retail consumers, businesses that are shopping for you know, software or, or, or any kind of use cases, that sort of core use case of finding, organizing information is still really critical. It's always going to be important. But the way that manifests itself is going to start to change, right? And I think for the first time in the last six months, I think you start to see kind of Google kind of making its moves, obviously, but but there's kind of fractures in the in the in the kind of the, the so, world order of search. Right. So where interestingly it's not only Google, but some other players. Just last week, uh, we interviewed the chief business officer of Perplexity. Um, oh, cool. Which is uh, mm -hmm. which? Who happens to be my brother? Amongst funny things. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> so it was it was it was another intimate episode of relate to. But it was really interesting to see how they obviously, as a small, relatively small company, do, do not want to go tackle Google head on. Um, mm -hmm. But but they, they there is a change in user expectations of what you're going to get from an average yeah. search uh, at Google versus the more AI powered search. 
And, you know, one of the implications, obviously, is that, you know, some people who are investing in various SEO platforms, right, like yours, to build up um, their their kind of uh, organic um, reach capabilities now have to worry, well, what happens? You know, are we going to be a trusted yeah. source? Is, is Perplexica going to rate us as a trusted source and, you know, display us or no? Like, and how do we get ahead of yep. that? And, you know, and so guide us a little bit on, you know, what are you advising your clients at Bright Edge, right? Who are obviously making very sizable investments, just given the size of those organizations. Mm -hmm. And many of them are very retail and retail e-commerce yep. focused. So for them, this is, this is very critical. You know, what, what are top three, uh, pieces of advice that you offered to them that you could share with our audience? Yeah, I think I, I think that's a great question. So so maybe a little bit of background on how we think about some of these new search engines and, and how the world would evolve. So we've built this thing called the Bright Edge Generative Parsha, right? So historically, the way we get data, but like the data cube that we talked about earlier is we build these things, technology that can parse information, right? As, as we're crawling the web and looking at search engines and things like that. Over time, we built these visual parsers that could render the page and then calculate sort of where things are being placed visually on a page as search became more interactive. Now that search has become generative, we built sort of a generative parser that interacts with these AI search engines and then looks at the kinds of experiences that they create with the AI versions of search. So with that technology, we've been pointing it at Google's AI version, as well as the new AI search engines like Perplexity and U.com and, you know, these other sort of like, you know, Microsoft versions and things like yeah. that to look at sort of how did this sort of market start to change? And so what's really interesting is one of the big findings that we had is these AI search engines at the end of the day have to still get information from a source. They have, to, they have to find and cite, like in, in, in perplexity's case, there's citations, right? Like you have to find the, 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 the high authority sources of information, right? What is that? Well, that is the equivalent in a way as what in classic search is it's the top like ranking page rank. stuff. It's yeah, like authority. Ranking. Yeah, it's yeah. What domains rank well, because you still have to figure out what is the right source of information that the AI is going to use when it's answering questions, right? And so the first thing Otherwise, is, garbage, hey, garbage in, garbage out, yeah, and you get- Exactly. Like, okay. okay. Exactly. So the first thing is this, is you still have to really manage your site and your brand authority. Then the next thing that's really interesting is what are the topics where you have a right to win, right? What are the topics where you have topical authority? If I'm Nike, and I'm creating content about picking the best basketball shoes or the latest innovation for running shoes or kind of different types of sports equipment. I have a right to win in those topics because that is the heritage of my brand. That is what I have authority for. That is what all the audiences will turn to me for as one of the sources of that, right? So you want to make sure that you clearly identify what are the topics where you're gonna create content where you have a right to win. And that's going to be through whether it's Google's engine or any of the other engines will still go to those same type of sources in order for them to actually, you know, kind of cite that type of content. The third thing that we're telling customers is if you dig into the tactics, right, of the AI sort of how, like what AI search engines will need to do, they still need hints in terms of like, for example, let me give you a very concrete example. Um, in the world of classic SEO, which is so very important, you have to optimize things like title tags, and meta description that the search engines use as it decides sort of what things that you're trying to write about and what to rank you. In the world of AI search, because of the issue, the reason I talked to you about of kind of figuring out the source, there are new tags, schema tags, right? Where you can actually identify, I am the organization that is publishing this information. I'm the author of this specific article or piece of content. And we believe that those types of tags are gonna be very, very important for AI search engines because they're going to have to always tune back together who is the original source? Where right. was this first occurrence, right? And so there will be 
things like this, right? And, and so you can already, and Google uses some of these already today, that you want to make sure just like you optimize the structure of your site today and put in the right tags, there's a new series of tags, schema tags that you need to make sure you also audit your site for, implement for. So things are changing, but some of the core things are still the same and you have to prepare for some of the future, right? And so those are- Right, and so, so you, as, a, as an embedded, you know, leading enterprise vendor, you basically just need to add that module and make sure your that's customers right. feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's that's that makes it. That's right, of sense. and and there's some there's some really interesting things. Like I would also yeah. say we've been playing with this a lot, right? So the other thing I'd say is think of the average searcher in two years; they will be a hundred times better at searching, right, for whatever use case. And the reason is because the AI search engines, what the power core, of, that, that, that they're all going to get really good at is. If you put in a single query, it is going to know how to make it a hundred times better in all the related things that you need to research when you're trying to, let's say I'm trying to, you know, buy a beginner, I, I'm trying to buy a guitar as a beginner, right? It's going to actually go figure out what's the right kind of music for me to get, what kind of right guitar to look at, what are the ones that have the best reviews, which models I should compare, what are the prices, it will just go execute all those queries and come back and summarize it all because that is what the AI is really good at. It is really good at like executing a bunch Condensing of things. Condensing across summarize five different way. five different sites mm -hmm. versus just one. Got it. That's so right. let's so so let's dive into the sort of authority uh authoritative sources, right? So mm -hmm. one of the um interesting kind of almost tragedies and from my point of view of um of a CEO, the way it works is that some of the most authoritative content that companies produce, particularly I would put in the B two B world. So let's just focus on the B two B, which is many of our audience and you know, live in that universe. So then they produce, you know, a fifty page ebook, a 10, fifteen page white paper, a four page mm -hmm. study of you know a detail webinar or kind of po event thing with customers, right? That have lots of pages, lots of content. So first problem is most of it is gated. So it never yep. even gets to the SEO world. And it is literally the most valuable things in terms of content depth that's not fluffy stuff done by some outsourced yep. content farm somewhere is is like it is kind of it is substantive right because it's the experts at that company that are producing it and then mm -hmm. the second thing is fine um i've ungated at some point or some of it like i'm i'm a progressive marketer and i say gates are bad and we want to reduce friction for our audience and i'm just gonna go and share this pdf with you you know, it's because typically the, mm -hmm. the the format for that is the PDF because then it gets too messy to try to do it all as a web page. And anyway, having like 50 long, 50 page long web page is also kind of a nightmare to consume. Um, yeah. So what we end up having is some of the more substantive ideas that businesses, scientific organizations, nonprofits produce are these pdfs and google kind of parses mm -hmm. them and you could have more insights on that but you you can't get something like oh you know you read this pdf and get to page land in page 54 you know which is the mm -hmm. one that you need right like none of that stuff is really possible in today's day yep. and age was a traditional search so we obviously have a point of view to relate to on like how we're fixing that by taking those mm -hmm. PDFs and you know breaking them down into atomic pieces of you know pages and making that all indexable and so on. But what's your take? You know, like you, you've you've seen fifteen years, you know, and, and folks <laughs> at your company maybe have seen like of what a B two B companies are doing, and it feels like somehow just strange to me. You know why why haven't they you know approached this was a little bit more thoughtfulness and you know if maybe they have and it just hasn't worked you know i'd love to get your take well i think for b2b marketers it's really really hard right because the metrics change for them and the metrics drive a lot of the behavior of the b2b organizations right and and ultimately for a lot of the b2b companies 
the marketers really align with the different go-to-market motions that they have at this company, right? So for example, if they're just really sort of short on like MQLs, right? They just, they just want to really tune up that lead convert page and they got to like, they got to tune that page up and get as many converts as they can get. And they a lot of times they get the content in order to get that lead time, right? And so um, versus like chunking up the content and sort of using it for different parts of the journey, which makes a lot of sense, um, but the incentives have to align, right? Because the, the a lot of times the, the 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 marketing team is going to be measured on very um, immediate objectives. Like what happens if the CRO says, "I'm light on my revenue and I need like 30% more leads and on this this quarter, right?" And and I want to see that like in a month or two. They're, they're, like we face this challenge all the time, where it's like, okay, well, the dollar ad spend and and they, right? so there's there's levers they're pulling to try to quickly hit a certain set of metrics versus like the longer term, hey, what's the customer journey or prospect or buyer journey? And what are the touch points that are gonna both kind of generate the generate the, the the lead, but also be able to kind of mature that lead in a in a in a process where it becomes you know good pipeline, right? And so there's a lot of stuff that is I hold on, let me check. So, so let's agree that incentives drive behaviors, right? Like this is, mm -hmm. let's, yep. let's agree on that. So one strategy is um, fine. Let's kind of like improve our incentives. Let's like really drive our alignment between marketing and sales. And it's not just about MQLs of, you know, you know, fake emails or whatever people put in there, but it's actually mm -hmm. yeah. moving people That's towards yep. to to sales mm -hmm. qualified leads to actually, you know, in accelerating sales cycles and so on. So let's say we um, we kind of we're a little bit more aligned on the kind of end product buyer experience, building trust, mm -hmm. etc. Still, I think marketers behave kind of in funny in funny ways because you could in theory um have the same document both gated and ungated right and the ungated mm -hmm. version is going to gather you the seo somewhere and the gated version is going to be the maybe the thing that you promote on social or in you know or you know email or other other kind of places where you could you know that it's more expensive and then so you'll drive conversion so because mm -hmm. you know, I think the average B two B buyer are they, are they really that interested in you know avoiding putting their email you know they're not going to go search you know try to see oh yeah but I could get that for free without download right like so you could kind of yeah. combine that and then separately there's mm -hmm. this thing called delayed gating which actually opens up the user experience to say hey okay this is great this is thoughtful yeah. you built and yet like we and we work with you know, innovative marketers. And even of those, not everybody is doing delayed gating, which is kind of an obvious mm -hmm. behavioral change, right? Like, because if you believe that you're doing something valuable, you don't want to hide and, you know, put in these forms that kind of first ask for your name and 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 then email. And then they say, oh, and, and this is the other trick that I see marketers use. And I'm curious at your kind of uh, experience with this is they would say, oh, it's, just, it's a very simple form. It looks like you yep. just have to put in your email and, and then you kind of start typing in your email. And the moment you've typed in your email it says, ah, gotcha, we, we got you committed, yeah. but there's actually now the form expense and you have to fill in all this additional <laughs> details. And I'm going, come on, this is like, this is lame. You're destroying your brand. Yes. Somebody will kind yeah. of commit because they've already gone in there, but nobody wants to be tricked. Not in B two B, not in when you're trying to build trust. So you have this unique position. Your CMO, you know, obviously, Martech expert, right? Like SEO expert, mm -hmm. but also you build, you sell to organizations with whom you have a trusted relationship. So how yeah. do you guys think, you know, and how's the thinking has changed in trying to accommodate the SEO goals for yourself, right? The mm -hmm. S, the obviously the lead lead capture goals and B a trusted partner uh, yeah. to your customers. 
So I think the way, so I'll kind of answer sort of the, how we're trying to approach this problem. Right? And we're trying to approach this problem also through the lens of how AI will change everything, right? So I really do believe that, you know, past sort of this, this Gen AI moment, a lot of how marketing happens is going to quickly evolve, right? And so, so, so what I take to heart as I think through that is, is what we tell our customers, right? Which is your brand and your company has areas where it has a right to win. And you need to double down on those areas and become the source, right? And so what we're doing about that is we're taking all the data and all the information from our generative parser and publishing it up and like into every channel, into reports, and it's not data at all. Like we're just we just push out, you know, that information. And the reason we do that is part of the reason we do that is that is what we have a right to win in. We work with all the big brands. We have all this technology. We're looking at this massive corpus of information around how search is changing in all these areas. And by publishing that data consistently and publishing insights from that consistently, it, it makes us the natural source of information for anybody, right? Like for the longest time, for, I'll give you a concrete example. Like we, we used to have a really hard time getting general PR coverage outside of the trade parts, right? So we have a great relationship with our, our core trade publications and we give them a lot of um, information and insight and have a great dialogue. But to get somebody like a Forbes or to get somebody like uh, Associated Press or Wired or kind of your, your broader kind of um, sort of PR uh, and, and publication, it was just hard to be relevant to what they're, they're, they're covering, right? But because- Jim, I just want to tell you, this is going to be solved now that you're on this podcast. There is going to be a, <laughs> between you, <laughs> between my mom and all the PR people and the press <laughs> listening to this. You're going to be just just stand by your email. But I, okay. sorry, sorry to go. interrupt. I'm going to be no, it's awesome. And 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 so and so a big part is like providing that out there, and then it it ends up being something where by providing that consistent sort of point of view, we're getting a lot more sort of covenant, right? And, and just from traditional PR and, and very interesting pubs and just interesting sort of conversations and, and being covered in stuff we didn't even pick, right? So there's areas where people just cover the data, cover the insights, because it's an area where we just, it's an area of the, the market where we just have a right to win, right? And so by understanding sort of as a brand and, and, and as a company, like what are the areas where you just have a right to win in creating marketing content around that, right? Um, then you, you're very naturally just the source. And that does generate, I, 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 it's very interesting. I get interesting leads just from even marketing executives that just reach out because they saw something that, that was covered uh, in, in right. one of these areas, right? And so you just end up, and, and so, it's a little different than kind of classic um, just lead generation, but you know, as we're doing more and more, and, and by the way, our SEO itself on the areas around AI and search, if we're getting that is a big chunk of we're growing a lot of our, our our leads and opportunities because as you build topical relevance around that, right, it just becomes something where then you have landing pages about that. Then you and th those don't have to be gated guides, but for our webinars on those things and and and, and those are kind of those live kind of side by side kind of those you know how you were talking about those progressive forms so we have a little bit of that but we we, we do that right next to our guides we have like long form guides on ai you know, so how do you opt like the ultimate guide to search generative experiences we also put out a guide to perplexity right things that we're seeing in perplexity and so those guides will have you know sort of forms that can be filled out at people with option but you got the whole guide right there, uh, and people will fill it out because so you're like, basically I mean, creating a double. So, so part of your strategy is you're creating the downloadable guide that captures the leads, and then you're mm -hmm. creating a web based version of that. Yeah, yeah, that and, right? and 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 also the and also the webinar, right? So, so also right. sometimes you're doing a webinar on it, and then it ends up being a a, a, a good sort of value add touch point. Got it. So. Back to the PDFs, right? Like, you know, yeah. just kind of funny, funny one, but let, yeah. let's say they are ungated now, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and let's say, you know, you're like in, in the world of some more resource constrained companies, right? Like you just don't have the capacity, you, you know, you're using some poor WordPress form that was developed, you know, a year ago. You can't just go and put this advanced, you know, 40 page guide uh, that you formatted mm-hmm. with Adobe or, or some other tool in into like a form. It's just too much work. So you basically have that you publish this PDF, right? And and I bring it up yeah. because in some industries like education and .orgs and .govs, there are more PDF pages than web pages. So if you kind of assume an mm-hmm. average, like if you look at overall what's there, like through Google and search, you just kind of get these crazy, crazy statistics. So these people are going to go start building, yeah. you know, super SEO friendly stuff, but they still have citizen services to deliver, you know, uh, students to engage was, you know, was there um, uh, various, various academic options that they provide and so on. So how do you, how do, how, is there something that you've seen that people do that make, you know, their PDF type of content more, more accessible or, you know, is, is there a workaround? Is there some design things that people are doing? What's your take on that? And, what can people do to make the PDF work a little bit better? Yeah, I mean, I think that with PDFs, um, so Google does crawl the PDFs, but it's not as, you know, like you mentioned, I think there, there, there are challenges with that, right? And so the main thing we do see a lot of people do with PDFs is, is a little bit more, they take chunks of it and snippets of it, and then they pull that up and then put it into a web page. And then they, they, they do the gating thing, right? Um, and that is a very common pattern that people do, um, but it, it takes work, right? So, so to your point, I think that that approach is one where they can take the highest value PDF that they think they have, and then basically they put, they put, a, they put, a, um, put a structure around it. We tend to recommend that for B2B companies or sort of considered purchases to really make sure you have a good taxonomy, right? And so it's actually the flowing through of the structure of how you're structuring your site and the navigation that really helps kind of drive the kind of good SEO across these different assets, right? And so usually that's a step that uh, marketers kind of, even when they're doing the thing that I'm talking about, that they, 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 they kind of fail to do, right? Or, or they, they don't do a very optimized, uh, optimal job of. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you. This is, sorry for, for getting into that, but I think some of the audience no, here okay. are relate to, relate to users. And I think that this is yeah. an important opportunity for them and a chance to hear from an expert like yourself. Mm-hmm. And I kind of agree with you that the reusability, like ability to embed a page from a document, for example, mm-hmm. specific page, right? Allows you to really quickly build like mini landing pages in, in, inside your WordPress or Webflow, whatever that kind of, uh, that are easy to navigate and then get people immersed inside, you know, and maybe it's an executive summary version of the big report that they immerse in and then still go to the download and so on. So it makes a lot of sense what yeah. you're describing of kind of trying to chunk it Versus, you know, here's this 80 page, really credible, actually, you know, report, but it's kind of a monolithic thing that, you know, has the credibility, but lacks the actual ability to find the things you care about because of all the friction in getting to it. And I bet you Google penalizes that friction uh, just by in virtue mm-hmm. of the overall approach, right? Like to, that they have that they will reward ease of access and reward you know, mobile friendliness and things like that. Yeah, like a good structure, right? I think what you have with with uh, Relacy that's really cool is like, let's say like a very common use is that I'm trying to do a launch, right? And I have this great, great asset, right? And I think like, if, you know, quickly being able to turn that navigation to lightweight, mobile friendly, easily indexable, right? That's, that, that there's a lot of use cases like that where the marketer just, struggles because the alternative that we see people do a lot of is they hire an agency and spin up a microsite and then it's just a a fairly uh, arduous kind of process and and there's a lot of time and care that they have to put into like structuring it correctly 
and then like making sure it looks good and then and then kind of getting all the content right and then so it's just it's a very heavy process that you know you see a, a good number of um, companies do um in, in a lot of these use cases well, thank, thank you for plugging us in, but let's shift away from us. Let's shift back to you. So um, you, there was like, let's say there are roughly three roles in marketing, right? Like three broad buckets. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that earlier. There is the, um, there's the kind of the brand ownership and the kind of the, the kind of the mm -hmm. brand, the, the brand content role. Uh, there is the, uh, the, 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 product marketing role like the sales the salesforce mm -hmm. experience that you've had and as yeah. a founder you're basically product marketer in, in many many big ways right and then there is mm -hmm. the uh the performance uh marketer they're sometimes called revenue marketer role right and you generally like your your solution falls a little bit in more in the in the performance and revenue bucket mm -hmm. yeah but at the same time okay. You know, I, I as a kind of somebody that's re, you know responsible for overall brand. You know, I I want to make sure that you kind of you're in line with our guidelines. You know, and whatever search engine mm -hmm. optimize optimized content we're producing is still on brand. And obviously, um, um, you know, a lot of search engine type of content could be related to product, right? And 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 you know, that's feeding that. like the product mm -hmm. is the one of the feeders of that. So guide us a little bit on, you know, how do you feel different marketers, um, you know, succeed in the roles of CMOs, right? You deal a lot of times was mm -hmm. was like a you know yeah. given the ticket size, you deal with the CMOs. Do they, do you feel like um, people that come from one background, uh, you know, don't always succeed in the other, right? And they need to kind of wrap themselves with a strong team. You know, you've you've mm -hmm. dealt with selling to yeah. to various marketers for many years, and so it would be helpful to understand, like, from your perspective as a vendor, who's succeeding, who gets it, who doesn't, and what patterns yeah. you're seeing there. Absolutely. Um, so the first thing I say is um, because we work with so many different industries, right? What I come to appreciate is that a marketing role is so different by industry. We work with over 50% of the Fortune 500, right? And so PPG is very different than e-commerce, is very different than B2B, is very different than financial services. Like the role of the CMO is fundamentally really different by industry. But the food groups, right, of brand marketing, product marketing, you know, um, and, 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 and kind of revenue, right, marketing, those kind of major food groups, you know, sort of really exist. Right, it still exists in, in 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 each of these areas, but the question, kind of minor, major, what are, what are the kind of roles? So, in B two B marketing, right, in B two B marketing, um, for, you know, especially for software companies, I think a lot of the times the power core does start with product marketing, and the reason is it it almost always starts with your company's positioning. Right, like, the, mm. and, and that position start is rooted in what are your core differentiators and your your, your durable, long term, unique value propositions that you're providing to the segment of the market in which you target. Right, and so so there's certain for each of these companies, there's certain pillars of those that then from there derives the company positioning, right? Because it's rooted. So when you zoom out and zoom in, that's Act marries up correctly, and then the execution of programs for demand and revenue kind of then tie back into sort of execution against that that type of messaging and positioning that then flows through to how it. Because growing very fast was the wrong, that. growing very fast was the wrong customer is not is, is exactly. not an so idea is, is exactly. a recipe for exactly. distraction and, and even disaster. sometimes you can have false positives that you crush this market, but that's not your actual ICP or your durable sort of where you're going to build your durable value. Right. So, mm -hmm. and that almost always for a software product company is rooted in your product differentiation because, and product differentiation is interesting because you, when you dig down into that, there are core areas where you're building moats, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and, and where you're going to have your durable differentiators. And so the strongest sort of CMOs in, in B2B are very good at tying those things together, right? On the other hand, in CPG companies, I mean, they are amazing at like 
the big idea, the, the, the creative that kind of can draw, like, they, they, they know how to execute campaigns. They, like, they're, they're just, they're storytellers, right? And they understand what stories, there's a, there's um, a, a qualitative attribute there in, in some of those CMOs, they are, they are very good at, at that aspect. And that's paired with, the most effective ones are paired with, or, you know, have kind of a component now, more and more of a quantitative kind of, of, mm -hmm. of, of partner. And that can flip. So you, you see some really strong quantitative CMOs that then pair it with the big, big, um, big creative kind of uh, campaign execution types. And so, but those are, those are, those are, you don't see a lot of that in B2B market, uh, B2B tech, um, as much as that, right? As you do in TPG, the, right? Um, the, the, the power fours are a little bit different. Interesting. I, I do wonder uh, if, if that's going to be changing over time, because it feels like as the market gets saturated and the product portfolios get, you know, awfully similar sounding and God bless me to be marketers for kind of copying all the buzzwords, you know, pretty well. Um, it, you know, I have a gut feeling that the brand and the kind of the, the content trustworthiness is going to stand mm -hmm. out over specific product features, um, you know, quite yeah. soon. Like, what's your take on mm -hmm. that, right? Like, and, you know, do you see that changing? I think, I, 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 I think that any great marketing is, is great storytelling, right? And so that, so I'm not saying, or I think that's true in B2B, that's true in B2C, and, and, and I think that's true in both. I, I think, I think with, with B2B marketing, I think B for function sort of marketing is tough, right? But it's more about what is the durable difference? Like what is the reason for why your product exists and how is it different than everybody else in your space? Right. And I think that part is that 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 part, like crystallizing that is super important. Right. And and, and being able to position that um, you know, is 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 a core part of how B2B marketing will work, right? Right. So what you're saying is it's still core like you still need to find something core to the product and then then yeah. you build like, out. I'll give you, I'll, I'll just, give you a, yeah. I, I'll mm -hmm. give you an example. I'll give you an example that was I was uh, uh, sort of connecting with uh, with uh, Andy, who's the 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 the, the CEO and, and founder of Clary, right? And I think they've done a brilliant job of positioning revenue intelligence, right? Even like CRM has existed for a long time, right? Analytics and BI have existed for a long time, right? There's a lot of different elements of this, but like the notion of revenue intelligence and solving a revenue leakage problem, right? Ties together like they're different and the benefit in a way that if you're an executive, like, yeah, if I can get 15% more revenue, like, because I have inefficiencies that get pinpointed and I can act on quickly, that is the, the that is a, that's a lot easier to uh, position and articulate as opposed to I integrate with all these data sources, I have analytics. That, like, so there's a, a lot of core capabilities that are differentiators, but what's durable, like what is the durable difference there is actually that it's able to give you the intelligence to pinpoint the things that are, you know, driving leakage, right? I see. So what you're saying is the, it's almost the, we're, you know, what we're describing here is like, some people would describe it as category design. So they, mm -hmm. they, they designed yeah. this category around which their product is really well suited to support really, that yeah. particular <laughs> category, <laughs> right? As opposed to some other yeah. products that maybe are great for sales enablement or sales intelligence, mm -hmm. or, but, it, but or sales engagement or something like that, right? But but then, so I, I buy into this, but like, as you remember at Salesforce, you know, Salesforce, you know, reinvents itself every year, depending on what the trend is. Right now it's yeah, AI, but absolutely. at some point it was all about social. And at some point it was, so, uh, and, you know, and we, you know, in building, you know, companies like success factors, like I remember literally every year we had to redefine our category, make it a little bit larger, reposition that mm -hmm. or this thing. Um, so it feels at the same time that it's getting really messy, even in the category area, right? Like, so 
it I feels like true. like people are consolidating yeah. and everybody now is in revenue intelligence. And so is the only advantage mm -hmm. that Clary has besides maybe some product hooks that they built in is that they were there first and they define that category? Or is that really that durable? Because a great marketer mm -hmm. is going to go and say, well, we're now with revenue intelligence as well. And they're going to have better campaigns I, I, or something like that, right? I, I think the interesting thing is there's a good campaign and good marketing and there's great marketing, right? And like Salesforce is, is great uh, as a success factors was great at great marketing, but in moments, right? Like of all the different campaigns that Salesforce did, no software was a defining campaign, right? Mm, yeah. That defined a category. And, and frankly, Salesforce called itself SaaS for a long time. It didn't work, right? And, and really, it wasn't until the term cloud came along that really pushed it into the mainstream. And Salesforce, yeah. to, their, to their credit, they did a great job of kind of owning that as, hey, I'm a business cloud, I'm a sales cloud, I'm a customer cloud. But those sort of moments in B2B marketing, I think it's, yes, there's a lot of tactics that happen, but I think that the, the, the stuff that really moves those companies into, from a marketing perspective is certain sort of campaigns, certain sort of positioning and messaging that really sort of cement sort of how the market perceives that company and, and the space in which they operate. And I think those are, you know, there, there, there are, Lots and lots of good campaigns, very few great ones. And I think it's harder now, to your point, than ever before of hitting those campaigns out of the park, right? Because there's just more noise. I mean, there's just more companies. There's more noise. Like how many of these? Like, everybody's AI. So right now, everybody's, everybody's AI. AI. Right. Yeah. yeah. Some people, yeah. and you know, generative, it doesn't matter. It's all AI, right? Yep. Um, it's all AI. And, <clears throat> and that's, if that's the biggest platform shift, Right. That sort of, you know, we're trying to capture, you know, it's almost becomes meaningless. Like we even started to de-emphasize saying AI powered everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, because like, I, yeah, like it, you would have to be pretty stupid not to have this something AI powered if you're dealing with content. Right. Like and and so I wonder <clears throat> what would be your advice in having, you know, you've created this enterprise as CEO platform category uh you know so mm -hmm. do you think it would be that easy to do it now what would you do like would you create a different you know if you had to do it over would you create a different category would you go all the way from the enterprise to the mid-market to compete with folks like a cm rush and other um you know other players in there like how would you go about you know what was a wisdom of 15 years redefining the category if you had to b build another search oriented uh, startup today so if i were to build another startup today i wouldn't go after this market because you have incumbents right i think when you're doing a startup you got to be really thoughtful about what is like what category you're going after and why you're going to win and why now right because like some categories are ripe for destruction some categories are just emerging, so it's just going to be a new market. So sort of typically are going after one of those two things. Either you're disrupting an existing series of incumbents or you're going after you're going after a brand new category, right? And there are pros and cons to each. Having created a category, I can tell you all the battles that are in that. Um, but once you've created a category, you do have a lot of you do have a lot of benefits of of, of, mm -hmm. of being, as long as you continue to innovate, as long as you stay ahead of the curve. I mean, if you stop innovating, you die, right? And so, so I'd say I'd be very, very thoughtful about what category I would go after as a founder, right? And in particular, I think the thing that's different right now that was not the case um, when we started is that if I'm starting a company today, I would think really, really hard about why isn't GPT-8 going to kill my company, right? Because it takes like four or five years for your company, like we start to kind of really owning a market. It takes about four or five years. It's kind of in that neighborhood, right? Um, so by the time you're in your market, really hitting your stride, you don't want it to be something that's commoditized by whatever is kind of on the war path for the AI. And because they're just, they're getting right now, think about GPT-4.0, right? 
what is that going to be by the time it's GPT-8? You don't want to be in the rip, ripple effect of getting crushed just by, you know, by, by those models getting smarter and smarter and more and more domain expertise, right? And they are going to get more and more domain expertise. And so, but there's a lot of areas where they're just not going to have domain expertise. And so I think one big part is starting a business today, you got to really sort of think about just from a core sort of market perspective, you know, how does that play out, right? Um, second thing uh, and it almost of, okay, feels... It, like if I if I double click on that, so it almost feels what you're saying is that you actually need to be a lot more focused on delivering a total solution, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, otherwise, you're with data workflow, with, mm -hmm. right? Data so the go workflow, much deeper. Go yeah, much go deeper. much deeper, yeah, right? And yeah. and then if you're going deeper, like yeah, like look, of course, you know, there's some. They're not gonna. They're not gonna do that. Right. Yeah, I mean, like, why, why would and, why would Chat GPT care and about everything... insurance brokers? Right? Is that like really that's that right. important to them? That's right. And, like, yeah. And everything that they do actually helps you, right? Because you're just going to benefit yeah. from the models yeah. getting better and better. Yeah. So, so you got to play the side of the coin correctly. But you, you, if you're playing the other side of the coin, you're you're just going to die. <laughs> like, like, yeah. like, you know, general legal tools, general healthcare. There's there's a lot of general things that would just get gobbled up. Like the, the information would just be gobbled up, and and it'll be very difficult to 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 uh, to win in those markets, right? And so this is sort of exactly of, like Google created little mini vertical search engines over time, you know, to, like to address these niches that were just as good as some specialists. There's still room for the yeah. specialists because the category was large, but you know now you have, you know quote unquote Google is moving much faster, <laughs> you know, like then like there well, was Google's time, moving faster right? and like, also yeah, and, and, yeah and, but also you got Google, you got you got you got Google, you got you know open AI, you've got clearly you've got you know Facebook dumping a lot of money into into in, into certain moves there as well. Like all the big players are gonna pile on their versions and commoditize a lot of stuff. Right. And and certain infrastructure things are going to belong in the domain of the big class, right? Like right. Microsoft will have their, right? And then, you know, and Google has their version of GCP. And, and so, and AWS will have their versions. And so certain parts, and now some of those could be good acquisitions, right? They'd be playing that out. It's like, okay, well, sometimes certain things are just gonna lead to the market and just get gobbled up. And th that's, that's a reasonable play, but you gotta be, you know, you gotta play out the timeline. It's one of the hardest things I think if you're starting a company, like, where do you think the market plays out? Because it's always not that symmetrical and there's a lot of non-linear non dynamics in there that you gotta kind of have to think through. And, and you're making bets that you're moving around on um, as these markets play, right? And so it's not let's easy. Say, let's uh, say you're not, you're not or, starting or, a company. Let's say you're mm -hmm. a marketer that wants to yeah. keep your job you know, like, yeah. you know, I think which is actually increasingly, you know, not all jokes aside, it's tough. Uh, in some some segments of B2B, like recession that we felt yeah. like a lot of very talented folks were simply let go because uh, the the marketing budgets were slashed. Right. Like and uh, they were the first things to go. So you want to keep your job. You want to get good at your job. Right. And you've been, you know, at mm -hmm. this evolution at, at, uh, of the MarTech. So. You know, one of the things that we think about it related to is how do we make our customers successful? Like, right? how do we get yeah. them promoted? How do we get them yeah. to enjoy their work? Um, you know, and and really feel like they they derive meaning out of the what they create, right? Like, so it's sort of creator mm -hmm. economy. So it's pretty fortunate, actually. Like, not every product has the the opportunity to to feel like it taps into something fundamentally human but it, in the enterprise you still help people with their careers and movement mm -hmm. so how do you how do you think about that what advice would you have for people that are you know starting out early in their career or mentoring somebody who's early in their career mm -hmm. having seen and worked with so many marketers over the last 15 years like who are the ones that are succeeding what did they do what's a common pattern yeah, so I think just like just like you, what we focus a lot on is customer success and watching how we can help marketers grow in their career. And the common threads I think that have endured, you know, sort of before and now is actually sort of being able to communicate and align organizations. 
I think for marketers, it's one of the hardest things, right? It's very rare that marketing lives in a silo and, and can drive kind of revenue on their own, right? So a lot of it is about alignment and communication and a lot of the soft skills are very, very important for marketers. And so I think that's one that's been true um, before. It's gonna be even more important in, in the next sort of era. The second thing that, that is completely new is being able to manage AI, right? And so we, we built more and more of these sort of co-pilot capabilities and autopilot capabilities, kind of a lot of AI automation capabilities, but there's still human in the loop there, right? So, so your, your, the, the human creativity aspect, the, the kind of reviewing things still requires a lot of thinking, creativity, understanding of your company's brand, its mission, its go to market, what you're trying to differentiate on, where you're trying to win, right? And all these different aspects that just have a lot of nuance that's important for a person, right? Kind of to be able to have that human judgment at the same time, being able to leverage the mm. technology, right? And, and being, you know, sort of open to playing with the new technology and leveraging it in order to win. And I think that's a very sort of important and new dynamic that is now out there in the market. Like you can do things at, and, one tenth of time that it took two years ago. There's a lot of use cases that are like that. And if you're not doing that, you should challenge yourself to play with it and learn to do it because it's managing the AI. Well, brilliant bits of wisdom for, for the founders, for marketers. Jim, if people want to continue to tap your wisdom, where can they find you? Yeah, I'm on. Uh, follow me on uh, LinkedIn. It's uh, LinkedIn Jim Yu one, uh, and then also on Twitter at uh, Jim Yu. So it's uh, x.com slash Jim Yu. Perfect, Jim. So good to connect. Thank so much fun, and huge congratulations on your success with Bright Edge. It's just super impressive to see how from those humble beginnings. Thank you for sharing those. To you know, you've you've built a, such a thoughtful. And successful company uh, and effectively led a category uh, that's super critical for many of the largest organizations in the world. Congratulations and thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Alex. Really appreciate it and really uh, enjoyed it.